Hi, so my name work. Uh, to, to, we have the pointer. Something that I don't understand. I see. Um, okay, so this this is okay. Ah, ah, so yeah. I tip a mouse. Yes, but I think you have to because it's it's a laser pointer. You have to kind of do it there. Uh, so you, it's, there it's, it's not sensor, a laser. Right? It's, a, it's a, like yeah. a mouse. It's like a mouse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So okay. you have to. Somewhere? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Can I check if mine isn't there? <laughs> yes. And can I like delete one bullet point? Uh, <laughs> what time is it? It's right there. Yeah, but what is it? Yeah, you have a minute, yes. Yeah? Uh, yeah, I'm just gonna. Yi Tay Park? Yes. Okay. I'm trying not to butcher names. I'm asking everybody. Yeah, yeah, can you just delete that one? Time dependent? Yeah, yeah. Just, just delete it. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Save. Thank you. No problem. Okay. 
Bravo. Just So just quickly another announcement about the posters because the poster session will be this Ooh. afternoon but again you can hang your poster mm. whenever you want and leave it there. Um, so there is a corridor all around this room with, uh, where, with, where you can hang posters anywhere basically. The only problem is that the, the corridor is very narrow so if we all uh, enter the corridor during the poster session mm. it will be a close packing situation. So either you distribute the posters along the corridor or we sort of uh, figure out a time planning or anything. Yeah, but there are two exits, so it's, it's really around this room. So if you go there, for example, there's one entrance and the other one is over there. I hope it is clear. In case, just ask. Great. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Will Shoemaker, and welcome to the Eco Evolution Dynamics session. Uh, for the speakers to note, um, I'm going to be sitting, and I'll stand up when you have two minutes left for your talk, uh, not including time for questions. So that's the two minutes you have to wrap it up. And first, let's welcome uh, Samir Suwais. Thank you. Thank you, Will. So um, today I'm going to talk about a uh, work that Roberto from uh, the University of Granada uh, did uh, when visiting in our group last year. So I'm going to talk about uh, stochastic trade-off uh, and the emergence of diversification in a evolutionary experiment. So uh, we can study um, eco-evolutionary dynamics uh, in very controlled settings. Um, both in uh, experiment of batch culture or also in chemostat experiment. And uh, in this experiment, we can uh, actually observe uh, the emergence of different ecotypes. Um, in exam for, for example, in this uh, experiment, this is batch experiments, there is a, a species that is uh, growing on glucose. This is the ancestral species, the black one. And at a certain point, there are ecotypes. And there are one, the two different ecotypes appear at a certain point in the experiment. One is a slow switcher, switcher that can uh, consume glucose at fast rate. And this is the, this blue one. And one, also one fast switcher that can consume more slow, slowly, both because uh, glucose and uh, can uh, uptake glucose and also acetate. Similarly, in the chemostat experiment, uh, one can uh, if we uh, wait long enough, uh, see the emergence uh, from the chest of species of two new ecotypes, a uh, glucose specialist that uh, behaves similarly to the ancestral species, and one acetate scavenger, because acetate uh, acidify the environment and typically is detrimental for uh, the um, glucose spe specialist. While these uh, new ecotypes can consume acetate even in the presence of, glu of, of, uh, of glucose. And so it can uh, basically it can grow for a longer time, although at a certain point uh, uh, both the resources uh, are, are, are done and so they both decrease. So uh, from a modeling framework point of view, uh, this kind of uh, um, dynamics, uh, evolutionary dynamics, can be described using adaptive dynamics framework. So this is a trait-based model. Uh, that uh, assume accessory reproductions and uh, in uh, where we consider that mutations are rare and also small, uh, meaning uh, that uh, mutation just give uh, uh, incremental uh, changes uh, in, the, in the trait. Okay? And so, for example, in this, for these experiments where we have glucose and species, uh, a species grows with glucose and uh, release uh, acetate, as a byproduct of the, met of the uptake of glucose. And this, uh, this acetate uh, acidify the environment, so we can write the following model that is uh, known as a consumer resource model, 
where we have uh, this species that eats glucose, releases acetate, and it acetate acidifies the environments. And so this is the abundance of the species that is eating on glucose, okay? And uh, also can uh, uh, consume acetates uh, that nevertheless uh, the glucose is preferred. So if the glucose is very high, this term is very low, okay? So in, in this case, you can also observe the so-called deoxy shift. First, uh, there, there is a consumption of glucose, and then just uh, eventually there is consumption of acetates. And uh, because acetate acidifies the environment, this causes a limitation of the growth of the species, and so this is why there is this term here, okay? And uh, glucose, this is the resource, the glucose, that there is an input of the resources, so we are in a chemostat setting here. And then, uh, of course, glucose is uh, consumed by the species. And then there is acetate. Acetate is uh, produced because uh, as a release, uh, as, a as, a, as a waste of the metabolic uh, uh, reactions in the bacteria, and is consumed by the bacteria, and then there is, uh, of course, dilution. Okay, so in these models, we have uh, several experiments. So the ecological variable are the, the abundance, the glucose and acetate concentrations. Then we have uh, the several constants for that limits the mono growth, that are these Ki. The, uh, then there are also the uh, traits that are the maximum growth rate, Vg and Va, and these will be our evolving traits in the model. And nevertheless, these are, uh, uh, it, it's a choice, okay? One can decide different evolving traits. And uh, in order to avoid the Ruidian demon, so a species that uh, is basically uh, best in doing everything, uh, we, uh, we need to introduce a trade-off between uh, uh, glucose and, 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 uh, and the, the, the growth rate uh, of, the, of the species, the trait uh, of the, uh, for glucose uh, growth, and the one for the acetate. And this is the, this is the growth rate, okay? So uh, in this framework, uh, we can use this adaptive framework. Basically, we uh, started to have a mutation in the parameter Vg and Va. One can look if there are conditions for which new species fixate in the, in the, in the dynamics. It is a, mu a mutant will be not uh, uh, excluded by the ancestral species, but will fix in the system. So for example, here we can see this point. It's a called branching point where the new species emerge. And in this uh, curve, Vg, Va, we can see that uh, when there is uh, this mutation lead to this uh, uh, point here, then the diversification occurs. Of course, uh, this is a deterministic uh, uh, diversification in the sense that uh, when through mutation we reach this point, then we, we will have that this new uh, branching uh, will occur. The framework of adaptive dynamics here, I'm not presenting, it's quite classical, then if you want I uh, can give a uh, reference on, on it. And, uh, and so we, can, we are able, through the modeling, to describe this emergence of new species. Nevertheless, in experiment, we observe that the diversification varies. It's not uh, uh, always observed or not observed. So these are different experiments in batch uh, system, in chemostat system, and we can see that uh, basically, uh, we, for example, in chemostat, we see 50% 50 of the time we see the emergence of, of ecotypes, of new ecotypes. While for other 50%, there is no emergence of the ecotypes. But the system, the system setting, the experimental setting is the same, okay? Nevertheless, we can observe or not observe the emergence and the fixation of new ecotypes. Or for example, if we look here in this table, always for the chemostat experiment, we can see that there is a, um, uh, the, when the, this is the acetate scavenger concentration, a, a different time, and we can see that it's very variable. So at the same similar time, we can see that there are very different uh, acetate scavengers concentration. So to, let's say, try to model these uh, differences, our idea was, okay, we have uh, some metabolic constraint of the species, and uh, we focus on specific trait, uh, acetate and uh, and glucose growth rate, and uh, we have several uh, evolutionary experiments, but of course, but actually, what uh, we project in the true phenotypic space is uh, what we see, that the curve, what we see in the two-dimensional phenotypic space is actually a projection of a high-dimensional trait space, and so mutation that can happen in different traits uh, can also affect, uh, let's say, the uh, the, the, the traits uh, of, uh, of the, the, the two considered traits. So in other words, 
what we are looking in the VG and the VA uh, curve trade-off is actually on a kind of effective uh, result of a higher dimensional uh, phenotypic uh, space. And therefore, we don't move only exactly in deterministically along the curve, but there is a, some kind of fluctuation in this trade-off curve. This is the main idea of the tra uh, stochastic trade-off. So uh, this is not uh, the new idea. We, uh, the, there are uh, at least two papers that uh, somehow mm, propose uh, this uh, stochastic uh, trade-off uh, in different settings. The first paper is by uh, Good and collaborators, where uh, basically they discriminate between two types of mutation, one that directly alters the organism ability to, to utilize the resources, as in our case, but other mutation that affect community structure by altering, for example, competitive dynamics, or the work by Mikon and Gordo where uh, they actually study how clonal interference, so species, the, in, the interaction between different strains can alter the ecological the, the diversification and uh, eventually basically can lead to this uh, stochasticity in the branching uh, uh, process. So um, let's say that our stochastic trade-off implementation is a phenomenological way to uh, model different uh, ecological uh, um, processes that can uh, lead to this uh, um, stochasticity in the uh, evolutionary branching point. Uh, we did this in a very simple setting using a North Stirlingen process, so not going into detail, but again, the, the main point is that we have a fluctuation around the trade-off curve. So uh, using this model, we can see that based on the variance, so this is the variance parameters of our curve, we can have if the variance is very small, almost 100% of the time we observe branching, so we, are, we see evolutionary branching, but for uh, high variance, we can just observe uh, a, very, a smaller fraction of uh, branches, uh, evolutionary branches event. So depending on the, on the, large, on the, on the thickness of this uh, soft trade-off, we can observe different percentage of branching in our, in our modeling experiment. Similarly, if we look at the time of branching for a deterministic trade-off, it's very peaked around a specific time, but actually if we start to have this uh, stochastic trade-off, we have a very large tail of when this branching can happen, and eventually in uh, the concentration of scavenger, again in a deterministic setting, the concentration, depending on the time you look, uh, is very peaked around a specific value, while if you add this uh, stochastic trade-off, uh, there is a very large uh, um, heterogeneity in the concentration of scavenger that you can observe at a specific time. So, Adding this uh, simple, let's say, ingredient, uh, we can actually reconcile uh, with this phenomenology that we observe in real experiment. Okay, I'm concluding just uh, by saying that uh, um, we can actually um, rely on a more general framework uh, that uh, is the one given by Mazankur and Dickman, where you don't have to define a specific uh, trade-off, but you can just uh, look uh, at the curvature of the trade-off, uh, and when you have a short uh, and uh, range, very sh short range of curvature means that it, in order to have branching you need to be very fine-tuned, while for large uh, um, curvature range it means that uh, in many conditions you can have of curvature, you can have branching that uh, occur. Uh, we can translate this in our framework uh, in terms of branching feasibility, and again we can see that depending on the variance of, the, of our stochastic trade-off, we can have a whole range of different uh, uh, branching probability. And uh, um, just to conclude, uh, the um, modeling framework can also allow to make some theoretical prediction, for example, how what happened in changing a, a given parameter, for example, this is the supply rate of glucose. We can have an estimates, depending again on the, on the fluctuation around this uh, uh, trade-off, what is the probability of uh, evolutionary branching in different uh, parameters, for example, also the acetate supply. So for example, we can see both uh, glucose and acetate increasing uh, um, concentration, we can see increasing probability of branching, while, for example, increasing dilution rate will reduce uh, the probability of branching. So we thank, with this, I want to thank you, uh, especially Roberto, who is uh, the main author of this paper. Thank you very much. Thanks, really great talk. I, I wanted to follow up on the 
projection on the high, of the high dimensional space on the low dimension and gives you stochasticity. Do you think that effect will also be prominent when you think about the individual effective parameters because they are also a projection of a high dimensional metabolic network onto a smaller dimensional kinetic model? So do you think uh, independent permutations, uh, independent mutations and parameters, could that also be tinkered to, to kind of, you know, if you mutate one parameter, you also mutate another one because they are also kind of effective parameters projected from a high-dimensional space. Yes, so the idea is that uh, uh, because uh, the, um, the trade-off structure is actually more uh, complex, more high-dimensional, rather than just focusing on the two uh, growth rate of acetate and glucose, uh, the idea is that a mutation on uh, different uh, phenotypic parameters or even in this uh, one of the uh, considered uh, trait uh, will alter, uh, the, let's say, the, the, the effectiveness of the trait uh, of a of a different uh, one. And so that's why basically the idea is that uh, this high dimensional space may include a lot of ecological processes uh, and the metabolic constraints. Uh, and uh, what we uh, actually are looking is just a projection. But in this projection, there is this fluctuation that are due to this higher complex uh, structure in this. Uh, Ah, okay. You mean the mutation rate? Uh, yes, mutation. No, we are we are just mutating a single parameter at a time. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's thank the speaker. Next, we have Davide Zanchetta talking about modeling ecosystem patterns far from equilibrium. So, hello, everyone. I'm Davide Zanchetta from the LEAF group uh, in Padua. And today, I'll tell you about uh, some of the work uh, I did uh, during my PhD. Uh, more specifically, I will tell you about uh, modeling ecosystems which are far from equilibrium. And even more specifically, I will be talking about forest ecosystem. So the first, uh, I hope, very non-controversial statement that I want to make is that living systems are out of equilibrium as a paradigm. Meaning that, uh, of course, if you look at anything at a high enough uh, scale, uh, it will be out of equilibrium because there is a lot of stuff that you don't see. But uh, a distinction that I need to make is uh, between endogenous fluctuations, which uh, are endogenous, as, as the name says, and they don't displace uh, the system out of steady state and exogenous disturbances, which uh, I suppose to be large enough uh, to potentially move the system out of steady state. So being in steady state and out of steady state is what one may usually conflate with being in equilibrium or out of equilibrium. But anyway, so in the bottom left, you can see four pictures. And I guess you can find out, you, you can understand which is uh, the, the intruder. So if you have a fire, if you have a logging operation, or if you have a storm, like Vaya in 2018, uh, you have what is called a post perturbation, meaning that your system is displaced out of its state, and then what, hap what will happen, happen. But now, the fourth picture is a bark beetle. So what happened with Vaya, essentially, is that uh, the system was changed so much because of all the dead trees, uh, that these endemic species be became pandemic, and there is an ongoing pandemic uh, in the woods. Okay, so this is a prime example of the fact that uh, if a perturbation is large enough, uh, it can knock the system so far away from steady state that essentially you, your model, whatever you're thinking and you project your data on and you make a prediction based on, uh, is completely wrong. So on the bottom right, uh, okay, you can see some example of some indicators uh, that in ecology one may use, uh, which uh, for people coming from physics are just observable. Okay, and you can probably tell that uh, there are a range of time scale, a range of behavior, monotonic and monotonic, and a range of scale at which you observe. More on this later. So, at uh, the start of this work, I said, okay, let's uh, see what uh, we can extract from this kind of data. So, data of systems which have been perturbed and are undergoing a strong transient. 
So there are these people at Paracu, which is in South America, who at some point in 1984, I guess, said, uh, okay, let's do an experiment, because to learn stuff, you have to do an experiment, and the experiment want, was kill a bunch of trees, of course. And so what they did is they took 12 plots of forest, which is a highly biodiverse forest. They, took, they kept three as a control, and then they applied uh, disturbances, meaning, again, killing trees, with various intensities. So what of this? So they collected data over more or less 30 years, and then uh, people come around and look at data. So suppose you want to see what the biomass is doing. What you do is like a spherical cow estimate of the biomass, and uh, you find that it returns very boringly, very monotonically, to what we guess is the predisturbance value. But now, if you go and look at the number of individuals, okay, this is obviously not a real forest, I think you can tell, but uh, the, max, the total number of individuals can reach uh, a higher level than, than the initial one. Why is that? If you look at data, you see that after you, you kill, which is the second cartoon in the big plot, you kill a lot of trees, a lot of resource, a lot of empty space is freed up, and then you have an enhanced recruit re recruitment for a lot of years, and then uh, things uh, start to come down, and then something happens which, which we don't know because the data ends there. But this is 30 year span, and we don't know anything more than that. So, okay, what uh, kind of pattern do we look uh, at? So, not all observable are created equal. Because if you take mean abundance, as you have just seen, uh, so mean abundance is uh, the, to the total population is scaled by the number of, of uh, species, you see there is a, a local maximum. And uh, I should say here that the dark blue plot is the, con the, the, the dark blue line represents uh, the control plots and uh, the other are just uh, more, in, more and more intense perturbation. So if you look at mean abundance, you will see a response to perturbation. Even if you look at evenness, which is just what I defined there, essentially the Shannon entropy of the relative abundances. But if you look, for example, at time correlation, you see nothing, okay? So this gives us some insight. So let's go on very quickly. What kind of model can you put on this stuff? Okay, you can do, okay, let's take a consumer resource model for, for one consumer and one resource. Okay, you can fit the mean abundances, you're happy. Then you either put noise on it, so you have a neutral model that can give you distribution and whatever, so you can make assembly prediction, essentially. Or you put some disorder, so you break neutrality, the initial model, and you have uh, these uh, effective couplings. So essentially what you find is this. So if you look at the uh, temporal table power law, all, model all models can reproduce it very well. Uh, but, uh, Okay, for example, if you look at the yellow and the blue ones, uh, you can see that the cross uh, the diagonal correlation of the interaction matrix uh, will change dramatically the outcome. Because uh, essentially, with the, without structure, you can get perfectly the Taylor power law, but there is no spread. Now, if you go to the evenness, um, if you go to the evenness, uh, you see that uh, the structureless case is completely dead. So, okay, to sum it up, uh, uh, what we found is that uh, in this case, so not general claim, but in claim of, uh, so claiming about uh, perturbed forest ecosystem, uh, neutral model kind of fail, uh, disordered model have a moderate success, uh, which is increased depending on the correlation of uh, the, um, the interaction coefficient for this model. So I would like to thank you for the attention and the Leaf Lab, which is my group. Thank you. Next we have Joshua White talking about eco-evolutionary dynamics of phage and bacteria in the near and long term. Okay, great, thank you. I guess the mic is working. I'll be giving a talk on virus dynamics. You saw a little bit from Jacobo Marci yesterday. And just to put things in context, usually when we talk about viruses, we're usually talking about things as you see above. If it was a decade ago, things like Ebola virus, then after that Zika, and then every year and maybe even now, once again, influenza. And since 2020, for the most part, we've been talking about that, SARS-CoV-2. And 
a lot of us in the room, for all sorts of reasons, have uh, worked on different parts of this problem, everything from molecular interaction, cellular dynamics, immunology, and on my, uh, my group side, more on the epidemic dynamics and population dynamics. But today I want to talk about different kinds of virus that infect organisms across the diversity of life. And obviously it stretches not just humans, but uh, mammals, birds, plants, insects, etc. but also microbes at the base of the food web. And it turns out these viruses and microbes, for the most part we call them phage, from phagenos meaning to devour, are incredibly abundant. And they hadn't really been understood as being that abundant until the late 80s because people were looking in all sorts of interesting ways, but maybe not the right ways. This is uh, one uh, quite famous now micrograph where you can see these uh, stained things. Everything stained with DNA appears there. And you can see the scale bar, which is a micron. It's a lot of bacteria-looking things, or, or maybe archaea, or maybe single-celled eukaryotes. But if you look closely, you can see the arrows, which are not part of the marine sample, but they're just pointing at the things you should look at, uh, which are about 50 nanometers in size and contain DNA. And if you take those little red circled objects and add them up and figure out how much sample you took, you can do the calculation that there were about 250 million virus particles per million. Right? So that's enormous. It's a very large number. It's interesting in that sense, but it's also interesting because it was 1,000 to 10 million times higher than previous reports. You might ask, how did everyone miss? They were taking samples and then trying to put them onto bacterial cultures and grow them up and count plaques, if you've ever looked at uh, the growth of a virus on a bacterial lawn, and if you can't even get your bacteria out into culture, you're certainly not going to get the virus that infects it. Right? So there's this vast undercount. These viruses do all sorts of things. This is one example of a rapid collapse of a culture of Emilia and Huxleyi, which is a very important eukaryotic microbe. And rapidly, you can see the contrast between what it would do alone versus when you add the viruses collapsing the culture and the rapid growth in here over a few days, which depend on the cycle of turnover of the virus. These viruses do other things. So they infect microbes and they kill them, but that means they liberate organic matter back into the dissolved and particular organic matter pools, which means that can be taken up by other microbes. So they're really part of the ecosystem. So these viruses are not just agents of mortality, but they also modulate ecosystems in all sorts of interesting ways, particularly because they redirect organic matter and keep it small. So instead of that microbe dying by a grazer, which may be eaten by something even bigger in the food web, and eventually that carbon um, being exuded and then released in pellets out of the surface ocean it sort of keeps the microbial loop churning. And so viruses, in some sense, shunt away that carbon and keep it in the upper, uh, the upper oceans. So just to give you a broad sense, I mean, we're a very diverse audience here. I just wanted to give you the grand tour in about three minutes, four minutes, however long that took, to think about these globally abundant and diverse viruses. But of course, they're obligate intracellular parasites. So the typical notions when you hear about phage toxins is that these are predators. They come in very rapidly and they kill. But remember, they need their hosts. Right? They can't uh, reproduce without them. And so for them and their hosts, winning isn't everything. And so that could actually maybe even lead to phage and host elimination. And I, in the short time I have today, I'm going to try to give you three vignettes and ways we've been thinking about things that aren't as fast as killing as we might have thought, or maybe even not killing at all. Right? So I'll try to give you some recent work on some biases and ways that have been standard in the field to estimate these lytic traits, and then talk about the relationship between the lytic traits and ecology, the ecological consequences, and then get into when these strategies might be preferred. OK. The first one is work done uh, led by Marianne Dominguez Mirasso, a current QBio student who's wrapping up next year from Georgia Tech. And to start this, I just want to introduce the life cycle here. Most of you probably know this, that if this virus infects a bacteria, it injects its genetic material into the cell, takes over the cell, and over a period, which is called the latent period, the cell bursts, releasing a new batch of virions, which is called this burst size. And obviously, this restarts the cycle, and they can absorb to new cells. This way of looking at systems and trying to infer the traits has been done for over 80 years, going back to Max Delbruck, you know, should be famous in this crowd, where you look at the accumulation of these viruses over time. And you'll notice you don't see anything for a while. And then all of a sudden, you see it increase. Right? And I think if I can go like this right here, you can see all of a sudden this sudden increase associated with this latent period. In practice, the way this works is you mix viruses and hosts together in a flask. Then you dilute significantly here by a thousand fold to basically stop any new interactions from happening. And then you watch the accumulation. And then you count using these plaque assays 
how many viruses accumulated, and that's your way to figuring out these traits. What's interesting, and has been done, again, for decades, is that you get these kind of curves. These are all different examples of virus accumulation using this one-step growth curve, where the time obviously depends on the particular type. But we've given this vertical axis there to denote this first burst, which is how the community has typically uh, evaluated the latent period. So I want you to keep that in mind. You get these curves, and they view this point as the latent period. The problem, of course, is that there's variability. And these population level measurements don't necessarily account for that variability. So if they all came out at the same time, this probably would be fine. It would just see the step function, notwithstanding some of the variability and the timing of absorption in the first place. But if there is, in fact, some distribution of the latent period, then you can imagine already that what you're seeing is really a tail one side of this distribution. Anything that's coming out earlier, you're going to begin to see as part of this first burst. And if you ascribe that to the latent period, it's not just you're getting some variability in your estimate. You're actually getting a biased estimate. Okay. So what we've tried to do is take this model of this infected cell and take it seriously, that we have these susceptible cells become infected. And instead of assuming this kind of Poisson-like process in which there's this exponential waiting time, we add a certain number of compartments artificially to be able to manipulate not just the mean, but also the coefficient of variation of the latent period. And in doing so, we can have the same mean, but different versions of latent periods, which you can see in these different colors, and then forward simulate what this uh, experiment should look like. And you should notice that the actual latent period is the gray line on the right. And the time of first burst, even though they all have the same average latent period, are correlated to the coefficient of variation. And systematically, this means that this one-step growth curve, which goes back 80 years, Basically, it declines in accuracy and is biased as the latent varied, uh, variability increases. Right? The more variability you have, the more left-shifted you're going to be, which means you've underestimated the population mean, and you think the whole system is turning a lot faster than it really is. We're a theory group, so we've gone back and we're working on, I'll tell you in a moment about some experiments we, we plan to do. But for the uh, most part, not many people have looked at the cellular level measurements with the population level measurements. So here you have the x-axis cellular level version of this. You track individual cells. You know when either you've used a temperature sensitive repressor to initiate lysis, or you know the time of absorption. And you look at the cellular lysis time compared to population levels. And what you can see is it systematically underestimates. Right? So the population level estimates are faster than are the cellular level estimates, which again means we're overestimating mortality rates based on these traits. And again, this is in press, but it's also in bioarchive in case you want to see details. What we think people should be doing is not just looking at viral accumulation, but looking at virus and host dynamics, and basically trying to fit not just the mean, but the underlying probability distribution. We think that this can work uh, in principle, and we're working on this right now with Debbie Lindell on a ecologically relevant cyanobacteria cyanophage system, which should give robust estimates, not just of the mean, but also the distribution. Happy to talk more. OK, so that gives you a sense of just how people are operating and trying to estimate traits and maybe biased in those traits. And it turns out maybe some of these traits may not be as lytic as we think or as virulent as we think. So we've also been trying to understand a little bit about the benefits of not killing or not being as lytic as, as alternatives might present. Part of this goes back to work in this field for decades, which has suggested that virus mortality could represent 20 to 40 percent, 25 percent of uh, the daily turnover of microbes in the surface ocean. And that's really based on just counting the number of the viruses that you can count, counting the number of bacteria, and imagining that these are random contacts and the contacts are efficient. So we went back and asked, are uh, the contacts and efficiency of absorption really as efficient as they could be just by this sort of theory of, of a perfect uh, absorbing surface of a cell? So you can imagine that you have this diffusing virus. It runs into host cells, which are much bigger. And what we ended up doing on the y-axis here is just the measured absorption rate relative to the biophysical limits, which is why that dashed line is 10 to the 0 for 1. And these are just ordered pairs. And the bulk of measurements, and these are different assumptions about how fast the microbes can swim, the takeaway point is the bulk of observations suggest that viruses are not acting as perfect, you know, sort of perfectly absorbing to these cells, but instead tend to absorb far less efficiently than you might expect. OK. So this was an observation from some experiments. How do you do this in natural systems? Debbie Lindell and her team have come up with a way for sorting cells and trying to figure out how many of these cells are actually infected. 
Right? And so what she does is she basically sort cells based on size uh, and fluorescence into these two important types of cyanobacteria, embeds them in a gel, floods in with reagents so that if that particular cell is infected, it'll look like a small little colony, which they call these uh, polonies, uh, in a solid state agar. And then you just count how many of these cells are infected by the virus that you tried to search for. And what they found, despite the fact that there was 10 to 1 ratio of viruses to host, there was a very small number, less than 1% of these cells were infected. Okay, so that's what you see there. What's interesting, if you look here on the right side, is that if we assume contact rate measurements, so just by the number of viruses and hosts alone, we would have thought half the cells would have been infected. If we assume only 10% of the contacts are infectious, we get something over there. The point is that in order to make sense of the large standing stock of viruses and the small number of infected cells, we think actually most of these potential contacts don't lead to a successful infection. Now, it turns out this might actually be good. So these are two uh, uh, viral strains. Let's call them clade A and clade B, the red and the blue, which they've looked at in the laboratory. They infect uh, Synecococcus, so these are cyanophage that live with their hosts in the surface oceans. And you'll see the birth size for the red type, the number of cells lice, its virulence, and even the size of the plaques are all much bigger than that of the blue. So in the laboratory, red beats blue. And their expectation was when you go into nature, you'd find a lot more of this red type. It turns out not to be the case. So if you look, you basically find almost no examples of this red type in natural systems from which they isolated and they co-occur. But in fact, this less efficient type seems to be much more prevalent and abundant in natural settings. And again, if you look here at the densities, these are over a million of this particular kind of phage per milliliter, right? So we're talking about a billion in a liter. And the explanation, in part, we think that as you get more and more virulent types, they can actually draw down, theoretically, these host abundances, yielding more per infection. But the actual abundances and the actual impacts are going to be the product of how many hosts remain versus how efficient you are on your hosts, meaning that there can be these benefits of being intermediate virulence. So sort of being less lytic than possibly could be if you were in this nonstop growth environment, but when there's some limitation and we're actually looking at ecological impacts, a less virulent type can have more impact than a more virulent type. Right? So that gives you some sense that we think there's some issues with measurements of traits. We think there are ecological benefits for these less virulent strategies. Okay. So the last bit, I know this is going to be a lot of material, but I'm going to run through it, and I'm, I'm almost done before Will stands. I'm comfortable with him standing next to me. That'll be <laughs> fine when he's ready. So I'll talk a little bit uh, about when maybe it's better not to lice at all. This is work that's been going on for a number of years, and I'm only going to be able to give you a taste. It turns out I gave you the life cycle of a virus that was only kind of like part of the life cycle. Alternatively, as you probably know if you've read Mark Potash's book or you know Ido Golding, that there's this whole other thing called lysogeny, which is a virus can get in, integrate its genome with that of the host, and then it reproduces along with the cell. And there's some very interesting questions about decision makings and regulation, but also really eco-evolutionary questions. What are the benefits of not lysing? In, again, natural settings, you tend to see that there's a relationship between lytic infections when things are abundant in these summer months and a lot of lysogeny that you can induce and in not many visible infections uh, in these winter months. And this is called seasonal time bombs. And there have been other ideas, something called piggyback the winter, which is exactly the opposite. So there have been contrasting claims on when we should expect lysogeny versus lysis and how does it relate to environmental conditions, so which is what I'm going to try to do here in the end. And what I want to just point out is that there are many ways to make a living. So here on the left, I have a schematic of what happens when a virus gets into a cell. I'm going to call this the mother virus. It can burst that cell, produce a whole bunch of virions, and then maybe only a few of these hundred or more virions ever make it to a new cell horizontally, in this case three. Or on the right side, what you can see is that this virus integrates, divides three times, and then is maybe eaten or dies, also generates three new infected cells without ever creating viruses, right? or at least in the near term which means that at least in the near term, these strategies can generate the same number of infected cells. These are obligate intracellular parasites. But this fitness depends on context. And I will skip some of this just so I can get to the last fun bit. As you can imagine, these things, when I say context, depend on how many susceptible cells are around. And when there are a lot around, killing and jumping to new hosts is preferred. 
but when there are not that many cells around, it's much better to stick with one's host and replicate with it, all things else being equal. So in the last minute or two, I just want to ask what are the benefits of strategies over the long term. I think I'm still OK. Uh, and this is ongoing work. And it's a complicated slide, but I'll just try to give you the idea of focus on the right. That you can imagine a series now of opportunities for growth in which we provide cells and resources, add viruses, which may be able to form lysogens or not. They replicate, killing cells and making lots of these virions and maybe lysogens. And then there's some filtration. It's an archetype of, of an overwintering problem, that there's a boom period and a bust period. And the boom period, you're trying to make as much virus as possible. And the bust, you're trying to survive. And depending on what we put on our filter there, are the cells the things that are going to make it to the next generation, or are the virions, we can lead to an interesting tension. So in this case, if I filter out viruses, the only thing that's passing genetic material are the lysogens. But to make a lot of lysogens, you've got to make viruses to infect a lot of cells. So there's this interesting tension, right? So is there an optimal long-term strategy? Just to point out, in a single cycle, it's much better to be lytic. You see this blue line full of viruses is much better than any of these strategies, including the red and the blue. But if we then go over many cycles where sometimes we're filtering just a little of the viruses, sometimes a lot, what you can see is the lysogenic strategy kind of messes up, doesn't get through. The lytic does great until it doesn't when there's a bottleneck for viruses. And this temperate strategy is, in some sense, a bet hedging strategy in the sense that uh, Kim Sneppen and, and Sergei Maslov thought about it about a decade ago, but with realistic ecological dynamics. So we're working on this, and I'm happy to talk to more people. There are interesting questions here uh, on conflicts of selection across scales. And then I will just close up with a plug, because you know I wrote this book. And this is a very interesting community of physics of living systems. Everything we do in the group has a mixture of both of a physicist mindset, but leveraging the tools of nonlinear dynamics, which I think is quite complementary to a lot of the stat mech approaches that you'll find. And my hope is that we can use both of these together. I'm happy to talk more, especially with instructors who want to adopt the book. Uh, and that's it. I'll take questions. Thanks. interesting talk. I had a question about the first part, uh, where it looked like you are selecting for an extreme event in the distribution of uh, lytic times. Uh, do you think by changing the total amount of stuff that you use in the experiment, you'll get more viruses? And as a result, there will be higher likelihood of having somebody uh, in the, so to sample the extreme value of the distribution, can you kind of do an extensive scale up of the, ins of the experiment? Yeah, so there's a couple parts to, the, to that. I mean, keep in mind that I thought you were going to go a different direction, that, that the burst size may itself depend on the time. So we're actually exploring both. And we're trying to parameterize one of these empirically by basically sampling at different points. We, we think there's some physiological limits. So we're not going to get just after the virus infects. You still have to assemble the piece. So there is a minimum time. It's often called the eclipse phase. So we do think there's a hard stop, and that's going to help us. And so our objective here is, at least on the left side, we think we know where to start. How far off the tail goes on the right, there can be other negative ecological consequences there. Right? But I don't think we need to worry about all the way at zero. And we have a sampling approach once we know the average that we think but ph physiologically it's just not feasible to have it to be that low. So I mean, whether or not we have the right number of samples, we'll see. But I don't think we're going to have large deviations on the left. Yeah. All right. Let's thank the speaker. Uh, next, we have Yi Te, oh, <laughs> Yi Te Park talking about how tumor cells fight for survival. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Yi Te, and I'm a second year physics PhD student from Northeastern University. And I just wanted to uh, share some of the work that I've been uh, doing. Uh, still a work in progress, but still wanted to share it with you guys. 
So I want to start with this quote that I heard, a uh, pretty insightful quote from someone I know. He said, cancer is the black hole of medicine. And what he meant by that is, you know, black hole is just one thing in this universe, right? There are stars, galaxies, dark matter, all the cool stuff. But people are so obsessed with black holes because, one, we don't really understand it. But once we understand black hole better, we get to understand a lot of other things better, like gravity, space-time geometry, uh, early universe, and so on. Cancer is just one type of disease out of many diseases, but if we understand cancer better, uh, it unlocks a lot of knowledge in other things, like how our immune systems work, how inflammatory pathways work, cellular physiology, metabolism, and so on. And uh, actually, that's what I said um, <laughs> when I was applying to PhD programs. <laughs> and. Uh, so for us humans, cancer is a very scary and deadly thing. Uh, but I want to kind of invite you guys to think about this in a different perspective, in the perspective of cancer cells. And so it's not like these cancer cells are you know, laying with their feet up in the air, having a good time. They actually have to really fight for their survival as well. Um, cancer is a rapidly proliferating cells. So they have to constantly have to fight for uh, nutrients, oxygen, and so on. So they have to learn how to. Um, uh, alter their metabolism to uh, keep on dividing. And we are constantly bombarding them with therapeutic interventions, so they have to learn how to resist our therapies. Our immune system is constantly surveilling for abnormal cells, and so they have to learn how to uh, evade our immune system. And a lot of cancer in their late stages metastasize, and when they do metastasize to other spots, it's, that's a completely new environment for them, so they have to somehow adapt again. And so they, one can argue they really need to survive in pre, some pretty stressful environments. And I think one way they adapt to, uh, one example of such adaptation is something called persistence. So uh, I think there was a talk about bacterial persistence as well before. Uh, but I want to distinguish the two words, persistence and resistance, at least for the purpose of this presentation. Unfortunately, it's used interchangeably all the time in literature. I think a lot of people are more familiar with resistance, you know, essentially, Cells are not dying despite the cytotoxic drugs that are trying to kill them. Um, and they're just grow continuing to grow as if the drug was not there. Um, but in the case of persistence, it's a little different concept. They're still drug tolerant, so that means they're not dying. But they tend to be quiescent, which means they're not growing either. Um, and unlike resistance, which is gained through genetic mutation, um, whether it was pre-existing or acquired later on, uh, persistence is gained via phenotypic adaptation. And that means that it's reversible. And so in fact, when you uh, give the cells a uh, drug, and a lot of them will die, and then some of, but then some will survive because they will gain persistence. And if you actually remove the drug and let them grow again and give the drug again, you would expect them to all survive because they were, their parents were persistent. But actually, a lot of them will die again. So the sensitivity can be regained. And then, but then, of course, small population of, uh, will regain the persistence. And so, uh, so, as always, biology is very messy. Every time you thought you came up with a theory of everything, you realize that you came up with a theory of nothing. Um, I said it's drug tolerant, but a lot of them can actually do become resistant. Um, actually, uh, Marco and his groups uh, and his collaborators' uh, work shows that uh, drug-induced uh, persistent cells tend to mutate at a higher rate and therefore can become resistant uh, at a higher rate. Um, I said they're quiescent, but many of them can actually, re some of them can actually regain the ability to cycle and proliferate again. We call them cycling persisters or drug-tolerant expanding persisters and so on. Um, I said they're gained via, uh, persistence is gained via phenotypic adaptation, but that's a really broad term, and honestly, it's very highly drug dependent and system dependent. And I said it's reversible, but actually, it can take a really long time for them to relax back to a sensitive state. And so, uh, my boss, Herbie, um, and his friend, David, uh, published a paper in PRL. Uh, what they did was they looked at Straussman's group's experimental data. So if we look at, um, I don't know how to work this, but, oh, there we go. So let's look at a PC9 cell line as an example. Uh, so you can, what they did was first they defined the continuous variable called chance to persist, CTP. Uh, we'll use X as a variable later on. Um, but basically what you can, and what Strassman's group did was they looked at single clone uh, cells 
single cell clones, and what you can quickly realize is that majority, overwhelming majority of the clones have very low uh, CTP, although some do have a high uh, uh, CTP. And so Herbie and David, they use the essentially simplest model they can think of to replicate this behavior. And the uh, steady state solution of this is actually an airy distribution, which gives you a very sharp peak around the low X value or CTP value. But then just because you come from the same clone, like just because you know, have the same parents doesn't mean you and siblings look alike. So in order to give some stochasticity into the system, they, uh, for a given clone, i.e. for a fixed X, uh, they introduce another variable S, which spans all real numbers. Um, and they essentially use the um, uh, ornstein ullenbeck process with a killing term uh, with the drug. Um, and you can evolve the probability density of the population with respect to S. And so S, you can interpret this as a uh, phenotypic space related to survival. High S means high chance of surviving, low S means low chance of surviving. And for a gift, and different X will give you a different initial condition, which is essentially a Gaussian distribution around this S naught, which is determined by X. And as, as, as I said, X is a uh, survival rate at uh, time tau, uh, in this case, uh, so chance to persist is defined as uh, survival rate at time uh, seven days of treatment. Um, so this is basically defined in a self-consistent way. Um, but the problem with this model is that it doesn't actually tell you how the drug pushes the cells to become uh, persistent. So what I did was I added a few more terms into his already complicated equation. Um, so one thing I added was an uh, advection term, uh, which I, and I made it uh, dependent on the concentration of the drug as well as S. And I also I made the killing term more uh, realistic, uh, gave it a concentration dependency as well as S dependency. And I also added R, which is the uh, uh, very slowly increasing uh, growth term. And so the idea behind this model uh, or the assumption behind this model is that when you're at the low S, uh, basically the cells are dying, and then as you are, as the cells are advecting into a higher S, you gain the persistence. And then if you're lucky enough to uh, move to even higher S space, then you get to uh, cycle again. And so with this in mind, I can, uh, I made the concentration constant. Uh, for simplicity, you can plot survival curves. Um, for various uh, different X. And if I just take out the advection term, you can see all the cells will just uh, essentially go to extinction. Uh, but if I use my advection term, what I see is some of them actually can gain uh, the ability to cycle again. Uh, some of them are sort of doomed and will uh, eventually go to extinction. Um, and so then one can imagine there seems to be some critical value X, uh, such that if X is greater than this value, they might gain the ability to uh, grow again, and if, or if this X is less than this critical value, it might, uh, it, it will go to the extinction. And so we actually showed uh, there is an analytical way to approximate the critical uh, value of this X for a simple cases. Um, would love to show this to you guys, but due to the time constraint, I don't think I'll be able to, so please come talk to me if you're interested. And so in summary, uh, we describe persistence as a phenotypic adaptation to some sort of external stress, i.e. drug in this case. And we use essentially the modified Fokker-Planck equation, essentially the OU process uh, with uh, other non-trivial terms added to the equation to capture how the drug actually pushes the cells uh, to become persistent and how cycling persisters can emerge. And um, we also uh, found that we can find a, a critical value of X or chance to persist value uh, that can distinguish between the cells that are bound to uh, go to extinction versus cells that can eventually gain uh, per, uh, cycling, per, uh, cycling ability to cycle again. So the future direction that we are thinking of is to investigate the interplay between the clonal dynamics and the population dynamics. That is the X dynamics and the S dynamics. Uh, I've been already working on that now. And uh, we might uh, consider using higher dimensional model. Uh, for example, we can make the proliferation and the survival a uh, different uh, independent variables, which Clarenbolt and uh, other groups have done before as well. 
Um, and we are also in the process of comparing with uh, real world data, such as Oren and her colleagues' works. And uh, it, this particular presentation was about persistence, but we think that this such approach can be generalized to study uh, more general cases of phenotypic adaptation, uh, whether it's uh, EMT or other process, or how bacteria respond to uh, starvation and so on. And so I would like to give acknowledgement to my uh, PI Herbie, and thank you. Very nice. Um, so I'm not clear what you call cycling persisters, uh -huh. because persisters could uh, cycle and have a negative B minus D, let's say, proliferation rate. Do you call cycle persisters only when B minus D is positive? In particular? Yes, yes yeah. Okay. So the cells that are but actually... I think the ones, the ones that were observed that had the B minus D negative, uh -huh. uh, but still they were proliferating because B was positive. Yeah, uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, we are... So actually, if you go back to this very, uh, oh. yeah, this distribution right here, overwhelming majority of the cells will be in the uh, negative slash or very near to zero uh, overall uh, growth rate. Um, only some will ha actually have high enough X to potentially have chance to uh, cycle again. So in these sort of Fokker-Planck equations, we're used to having an x1 minus x in the second derivative. Uh, what prevents uh, x from kind of going outside the allowed region, becoming negative and so on? Uh, which one? The diffusive uh, uh, term, the second derivative. Which term, sorry? Uh, well, we, maybe it's easier if we talk about it uh, offline. Yeah, yeah, sure. All right, let's thank the speaker. Uh, next, we have Mehmet Vallat Inji talking about quantitative analysis of CRISPR mediated immune responses. Thank you. Uh, how does it work? I think you got to ah. get it a little up. Okay. Oh. There. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. Hi, everyone. I'm Vellat. Uh, I'm working with Herbie Levine. So recently, we've been working on the CRISPR-mediated immune response to see a coevolutionary dynamics between phages and bacteria uh, population. And first of all, the reason why we are interested in viral evolution, because it's a good framework for Darwinian evolution. There are some reasons for this. So they, 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 rep they, re they reprodu reproduce very fast. And they have short cycles that allows us to see changes easily. We don't have to wait a million of years. And they can reach large populations. And that allows us to make deterministic analysis. And for the large population, the natural selection overpowers random genetic drifts. And we know natural selection is the, is the fundamental mechanism of, of Darwinian evolution. And so we can see all these dynamics. So we have a conceptual model. So we, we assume the all viral strains and, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not full screen. You have a green mode. Thank you. 
Yeah, so we, we transform all the evolutionary dynamics into a abstract map. So this map is theoretically can be up to uh, n dimension, but it depends on the how many antigen is important for the immune system to recognize. For example, we can think of the, the coronavirus. So for coronavirus, the antigen are spike protein, and the number of spike, spike protein will be the number of dimension of the common antigenic space for the, for, to see the evolutionary dynamics. And we think of the immune protection sharing the same uh, space with the viral strain. So here a visual representation for that. Um, okay, oh, this goes fast. <coughs> So uh, this is not the only case. The, by definition, we can we know that in this space, if the immune protection and viral strain occupy the same position, the the, the viral uh, the, the immune protect immunity works. But to some extent, mismatch mismatch still work, and this gives a cross reactivity interaction among. Uh, viral strains and, and immune cell, I mean memory cells. At the same time, the, the immune cells has a memory component that gives a retention capability. And if we think these two, it gives a the dynamic network for interaction, or if we think about the continuous case for the, for the field. And these two, uh, the cross-active and retention capability, the, derive the emergence of these things evolutionary states. So here, a equation for a viral diffusion. So in general, we can think of this for any two uh, field, like, I mean, for any virus spread, but it is not, but it does, here, this part, the function g, yeah. So this function g make the each do two interaction unique. So, so and this function g of x minus y, which is the separation of phenotypes, is unique for 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 any viral diseases, and it has two important uh, component. One is so how does it decay depending on how far is the viral strain and immune protection for any, any particular time in the evolution. And the, uh, the other one, which is due to the cross activity, is how far, sorry, how far the G will still give us, give a instantaneous interaction to the, the spread of viral diseases. So for, for, for a specific type of virus, if we are looking for the evolution, we have to have these two components of G to see a biologically meaningful pattern. So at this point, we start to look for the, the, the bacterial adaptive immune system to get a biological G function. The reason why we look at this, you'll see soon, it is much more easier than human adaptive immune system. And the reason why I put the, the quotas to adaptive because it is not like adaptive immunity we know in, in, in vertebrates, but it's quite, uh, it's quite different. So in general, this, work, the, this mechanism works in this way. A phage uh, infects a bacterium, and with a, with, a, with a rate, bacteria can get a piece of genetic material from the phage, and and uh, incorporate it, its own genetic material. And this is heritable. That means this can pass to the next generation. So that's why we call it adaptive immunity, because it is heritable. And, and also, it can store these genetic materials to some extent for the, for the upcoming infection, uh, for, up, for, for another time if the same phage infected bacteria, these sequences will work as an adaptive Im immune response. So 
Here, if we think of our bacteria has two spacers. Spacer is the genetic material that bacteria can get from the phage. Uh, this is a simplistic model. So here the, we have the mean field, ordinary differential equations. So the important one is the more, uh, yeah. So it sometimes do next, next or sometimes take back. I don't know why. Okay. So in this equation, the important part is this. So here, x is for CRISPR array. I, J, and V is for the, for the phage. So we define phage to be just one spacer, and bacteria is a combination of two spacer, and this dynamics works with a rate of beta gamma so to bacteria uh, of spacer of JM to obtain a protospacer from virus VI, and in case of mismatch, which is this term, bacteria lose the battle and we decrease the, the population of bacteria. And on the second equation, this part is the dynamics of the, uh, due to the, the immune protection. So in case of the match of the spacer between a, a, a particular uh, virus, with the, the bacteria it infected, they lose the battle and it, decre it, it gives the negative uh, rate for the, for the uh, specific vi virus population. So we looked for a case of 15 spacer. We used the mean field equation I just showed you and we, we simulate this system using the given ratio with gamma, gamma, beta, and, and uh, other, other, other coefficients. And we saw this pattern here. You can see, so this, uh, this bacterial community starts with naive bacteria type, which has no spacer. But as time goes, they start to gain immunity, and they start to, like, they, they don't extend. And you can see after time, round seven, there is a coexistent relation between these two population and later we run this simulation for for more times and then we we use the Sh Shannon entropy for so uh, first of all these the model in this model a bacteria can get 15 spacer uh, each from the viral the viral strain in this uh, in this area do we have time Okay, okay, so we use the channel entropy to, you, to see the diversity for each location of the CRISPR. This is the pattern we get, and it matched with the, with the experimental work. And the point is, can we find a transformation from this diversity pattern and, of course, the, the, the protectivity of for each uh, spacer location? to transform into our antigenic space so that we can apply the diffusion equation, diffusion reaction equation, and to see the, the, the coevolutionary dynamics. Here, there are two important things. One is the number of spacer might be, okay, might be related to, to the range of the interaction. So that means how far a virus can mutate and the, 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 the immune system can still recognize it. The other one is we need the decay fashion of the uh, immune response, and this is, this is uh, related to, to uh, diversity pattern. Uh, this is my <laughs> professor. Thank you. At coffee hour, I think. Yeah. Uh, there's a question. There's a question. I think we'll do it at coffee. Okay. Yeah. 
thank you. I'm sorry. Yeah, we're, we're already supposed to be in the coffee break, so I, I feel very scared to get up and start a talk right now. <laughs> All right, yeah, that's where that works. Okay, all right, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this on the board, so a whole new set of uh, failure modes to enjoy. Okay, so um, I'm gonna talk about the uh, effects of space on selective sweep. So what's the question here? We wanna know, there's a natural population out there. We wanna know, has it adapted recently? If so, where? And uh, in the genome and how? And so examples might be um, insecticide resistance in flies or um, high altitude adaptation in Tibetans or many other genes that we don't even really know what they're doing, but we believe that there's adaptation going on. How do we know this? There's many different methods uh, to detect the adaptation, and they all basically rely on the same underlying dynamics, the selective sweep dynamics. So what does the selective sweep look like? If we look at the allele frequency over time, What we have is a very rapid logistic increase that takes place in time of one order, one over S, where S is the selective advantage conferred by these different mutations. And when I say very rapid, I mean compared to what Luca showed before, with the neutral trajectory which would take a time that's for historical reasons traditionally called NE and this is going to be much much longer. Okay, so that's the dynamics we're looking for. And we want to detect it here. after the storm has passed, typically. That's what we have access to. How do we see it? We look in the genome. So if we look along the genome, in our population, and we ask, how diverse, genetically, is our population, using our favorite uh, measure, uh, some, some kind of entropy. I'm going to be a little bit vague because there are many methods and they use different ones. What do we expect? Okay, so here's going to be our selected locus. And here, everybody shares a recent common ancestor. So there's going to be fairly low diversity. Okay, now, uh, how about far away on the genome? Here we bring in uh, what uh, Aravi was asking about, sex, recombination. Far away, there's been sex and recombination. So over here, we have basically the neutral pattern. These genes have been recombining so frequently with the adaptive allele, they didn't even notice it. And then in between, we have some kind of trough like this. So you can really spot the genes where the adaptation has happened. Now, you can measure the genome in units of recombination rate. OK? So we can measure it in units of inverse time. And then the width of this trough is of order s. It's basically a readout of the time scale of the sweep. So not only do you know where the sweep happened, you know how strong it was. And uh, down here, 
this fact that there's still some residual diversity tells you something about the number of starting mutations that kicked your sweep off over here. Okay, so you get, you get a bunch of different readouts. Okay, but as Craston asked, what about space? There's many methods to do this, and they basically all just ignore space. Is this okay? Space is a pain in the butt. We'd rather not have to worry about it. We're physicists, right? We want to throw away all the details we don't need to worry about. Um, so it's ignored. Is this okay? The justification is that in many natural populations, in flies, in people, uh, the genetic diversity is fairly uniform in space. Yes, you know, we do look different if we come from different places, but it's very, very minor. Basically, people are all the same everywhere. And so that's kind of saying, all right, yeah, there's spatial structure, but it's not that important. Uh, but if you really think about quantitatively what this is saying, this is saying that the mixing time, the time for the spatial structure to be forgotten, is short compared to the neutral evolution time. Out here at a typical region of the genome, yeah, everything is nicely mixed up. But that's not the same as saying that's OK to ignore space for the sweep. Right? Because we said that that's a much shorter time scale. And if you start thinking about the numbers that people infer, the most plausible regime is actually one where we have something like this hierarchy. Where it's not OK to ignore the effects of space when we look at the sweep. OK, so if we have to pay attention to space, what changes? Let me do the simplest example. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this well mixed to indicate that this is ignoring space. And let's draw something about this intermediate time scale. Let's say we have a one dimensional population. Uh, some re earlier talks mentioned Fisher waves. What do we have? Actually, let me draw a Fisher wave over here. If we draw our allele frequency now as a function of space, What we have is the traveling wave spreading through the range. In this way, if the diffusion coefficient is d, the speed is of order square root ds. So the rate of advance of our allele is now not only dependent on how good it is, but also just how quickly things are getting mixed up. And this will have to spread over some full range of length L. So what does this look like? Now, if we ignore spatial structure and just look at the spread of the allele through time, oops, I want to make sure that it looks short compared to the neutral time. We want an intermediate time scale, something like that. Right? It's not a logistic spread anymore. In the simplest 1D case, it's a linear spread. It's growing at a constant rate. And the time it takes is given by the time it takes to traverse the full range. And notice this is much longer than that time. All right, so what do we expect here? Yeah. 
They use a different color. Now orange is going to be the spatial one. Much longer time means more chances for recombination to happen. So we're going to have a much narrower much narrower uh, uh, trace of the sweep. And the time is going to be given by the inverse of this. Okay, so now we look at our sweep. We think we're in this world. We think we're in the well-mixed world, because that's what all the methods assume. We infer a selective coefficient. What are we actually inferring? A little bit about selection, mostly about the size of the range, the size of the population, and how quickly it's getting mixed. Not selection at all, and we're really underestimating the amount of selection. In addition, notice I drew this way higher. Okay? Why did I do that? Well, let's look where this residual diversity here could come from. In the well-mixed case, this basically has to come from pre-existing variation right here. Because if, a, if an allele comes in, if a new, a new uh, uh, mutation comes in here that's going to give us some diversity, it's hardly going to spread. Why? Because by the time the sweep is at, say, 10% frequency, so let's say we start at frequency, Ten percent. Everybody here is, on average, only going to be an ancestor to ten individuals by the end of the sweep. You're barely going to increase at all. Everybody here gets multiplied by a factor of ten by the end of the sweep. So you barely get to increase in frequency at all. Now let's say an allele, new mutation comes in. In our, uh, in our, in our one-dimensional population when the sweep is at 10% frequency. Okay, so the allele has, con the, the sweep has conquered 10% of the range. It still has 90% to go. And that mutation can hitchhike up all the way up to extremely high frequency. And then there could be another one that comes in later. They can hitchhike and go up to high frequency throughout the range of the sweep. They do not have to be present at the beginning. So we have many more opportunities to come in and contribute to this residual diversity. And these are really hitchhikers that hopped on the sweep, you know, hop-ons, not starting mutations. Okay, so what do we see here? We see, uh, as Craston already said, ahead of time, space really affects adaptation, even when it's not doing much to the neutral <coughs> evolution. Probably uh, creates biases in all our inferences about past adaptation in natural populations. Uh, so maybe um, maybe we're thinking sweeps are too weak. Maybe too many starting mutations. And then the, kind of the question is, uh, is there a way forward? And do we, is it maybe to infer the spatial structure first and only after that then infer the selection on that background. 
Uh, I don't know, open question, work in progress. All right, so ready to take questions. nice talk and great format. Uh, I actually had a question about the neutral population. So if I'm imagining, let's say, a population on a 1D or a 2D grid, then I would suspect that even the mixing time is not that small compared to the, even for a neutral population, this should be a problem. Because if the, if I have a fisher right population on a, on a graph, then the mixing time may be comparable to the population size itself. So even there, I have an issue. Okay, yeah, great question. So, so let me just repeat it. So um, uh, Purush Adam was saying, wait a second, if I take kind of my uh, standard models of population structure, actually they say that the mixing time uh, should not be that small uh, compared to the overall population size. So now, empirically, it is seen that in fact, for, you know, for people, for flies, for many other populations, genetic diversity is not that variable over space. So then there's a puzzle. It says that there's something wrong with our standard models. Um, if you ask me, I think that this innocent little assumption I snuck in here of diffusion is wrong. Um, every time we look at how things actually move around, uh, it appears that there's some long distance dispersal. Um, uh, it just The problem is that for most populations, there's no way to really measure it directly. Uh, so Along these lines, one of the, the, one of the ways we're, we're, we're um, attacking this in the lab is we're uh, trying to come up with methods to infer the long distance dispersal um, in natural populations. And I think we've made some progress there, and we can talk about that offline. What does space do uh, to clonal interference and to fixation probabilities? Ah, okay, great, great. So, oh, question was, uh, what does space do to clonal interference, that phenomenon that um, we, we, we saw earlier with the different mutations fighting it out and fixation probabilities? Okay, in the absence of um, clonal interference, it does not, uh, vanilla space like this does not affect fixation probabilities. That's, that, there's a nice uh, symmetry result there. Um, in asexual populations, uh, uh, work by um, uh, Martins and Halicek has shown that it greatly increases clonal interference. Basically, you can see it right here, it's really slowing down the sweeps. Since it's slowing them down, they're overlapping for longer, more time to fight it out. Now, uh, uh, that's another problem we're working on. We have some preliminary results that suggest when you add in a little bit of recombination, there's a kind of approximate symmetry where even very low rates of recombination are enough to knock the clonal interference back down to not that much worse than well mixed. Um, but yeah, this is, this is still preliminary work in progress. I can't use the tab. Oh, no, yeah, yeah, I cheated. <laughs> Apologize. <laughs> All our speakers. <laughs>